Hi. Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, I'm Nathan Harper from Graphcore, and uh, I've got here with me uh, John Garbert from Stack HPC. Um, so this morning is a bit of an opportunity for us to uh, go through uh, some of what we talked about. We were very fortunate enough to, to have an opportunity to talk to you guys about this in our keynote. Um, one of the challenges with the keynote is that we only have so much time, and uh, we had rather a lot of you know, what we think is interesting things to be able to talk about and not enough time to be able to tell everybody about it. So, so this morning we've got an opportunity to, to talk through a little bit more of the detail, we'll talk in depth a little bit more about some of the challenges, uh, run through some demos, and also you know, an opportunity to take any questions that you guys might have. Um, so uh, just briefly to kind of set the scene again, um, so uh, we at Graphcore, so we've, uh, we've built our own hardware alongside our own software. Um, so that is one of uh, one of these machines, which again, is looks like a server, um, but it's not a server, and um, or it's not a server you know, as as far as the end users uh, really care about it. Um, this is going to be treated as a uh, as a as a network appliance, something that is just accessible remotely over um, over our IP over fabric uh, protocol, and um, then uh, we've been building them. Um, Effectively, you know, uh, our reference architecture, each one of these racks is a pod 64, and that is our reference system. And for that, you get four application servers, you get a 100 gigabit switch, you get 16 IPU machines, um, all connected together. And um, they're designed to, you know, they're originally designed to run effectively standalone. So you have a pod 64, and on that pod 64 would also, alongside the um, you know, alongside the application servers and the IPU machines, it would also have to run all of its own infrastructure for actually operating that. So that includes things like um, your know, system services, even things like your know, DHCP to hand out IP addresses to each of the IPU machines, because it, each Pod 64 had its own broadcast domain. So um, you know, we'd have to run things like DHCP. Uh, our virtual IPU manager, so our uh, the server that is used to uh, inform users and applications about which IPUs they should be talking to. That would also need to run inside of this system, generally on the first um, on the first node, um, which creates some of the challenges about the you know, a first among equals, which I, uh, you know, in terms of systems, um, which uh, we'll, we'll be able to swing back around to um, in a little bit. Um, but. You know, as, as I said on the, on the slide, we're building these things effectively by hand. The, you know, the management of the, uh, the operating systems and the, the system builds was you know, kind of nicely automated, config managed. Um, but it's management of the infrastructure that sits around it, particularly things like uh, the network config and uh, switch, you know, switch VLAN management, um, was something that had to be effectively operated by hand um, because even though we could automate it, there was nothing that joined those things up, what switch port was connected to what thing, what VLAN those things should, um, should sit on. And so as a result, the, you know, the systems would generally be one big VLAN with one or multiple users uh, running on it. And um, that then generates, you know, if, if all the users are very nice and conscientious and uh, you know, ensure that they don't trample all over the work that their colleagues are doing, then everything's fantastic. Um, but the reality is even the most you know, well-meaning uh, user will end, at some point inevitably end up using some resources that they, don't, um, they shouldn't have access to because someone else is supposed to be using it at the time, or unhelpfully using all the memory on our first among equals machine and not only taking down you know, that particular system, but taking down system services that the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the pod uh, relied upon. So, um, you know, we then had you know, two drivers. How do we make it easier for users and our developers to have access, get access to IPUs, get access to IPUs uh, in their own small area, um, you know, something that they, they've got uh, you know, access to dedicated so that they're not in a position to be able to trip over each other. Um, how do we you know, move those, some of those system services outside of, um, outside of user space so that you know, a user you know, working in development isn't going to out of you know, out of memory kill the you know kill the system and you know things associated with it. Um, how do we give them kind of a little bit more choice? Uh, you know, in terms of what the you know, the configuration should be, uh, operating systems access to um, you know access to different numbers of IPU machines. Um, 
But all of that was also to help us to try and drive utilization. So one of the challenges that we've got as you know, because we are building our own, you know, our own, our own hardware, the pool of hardware that we have access to is only so large. And um, so when we, uh, and we have a number of different teams within GraphCore all developing different software uh, models, frameworks. And um, if we have a fairly you know, static deployment system, you know, what we'd end up with in the scenario is like, okay, here is the uh, pod 64 that has been dedicated for PyTorch development on Ubuntu 22. And then we have to have this one over here that is you're very, very similar, but it's got a, you know, it's actually, this is Ubuntu 20. And then, ah, and we've got a couple of customers that are running um, your Red Hat, so we need to have another system for that. And what that meant was that we ended up with a lot of systems, you know, these, you know, these are, are not inexpensive systems, especially if these are, are development, um, you know, this is development hardware, so this isn't part of a, a, large, uh, a large manufacturing run. Um, you know, these are expensive systems to be uh, sitting around idle, and so that was something that we really absolutely, we knew that we needed to, um, to improve. So that, that uh, started uh, you know, the development of our vPod, our virtual pod, and this was effectively an iterative process, and um, because of the, you know, the, the first stage was actually just doing things like carving up one of our pod 64s into smaller systems. Um, taking you know, different application hosts, dropping them into their own uh, VLANs with their associated IPU machines. And so then we could take a pod 64, carve it up into four pod 16s, and um, then uh, each one of those could be used individually without users crashing into each other, without trampling over each other. But as you can imagine, that, you know, that helps some things, but then it, we've now generated a whole load of extra work because those system services, things like DHCP, the virtual IPU manager, um, all of those things now had to be replicated across each of those um, each of those vpods. So the s potential for scaling this is, um, you know, uh, without any form of automation and orchestration, is you know, it can only um, it can only go so far. So um, this is then when we started uh, down in our, our adventure, bringing our IPUs into OpenStack. Um, because at that stage we knew that you know, if, we, if we can uh, manage that infrastructure, manage the um, uh, manage you know, applications, or, sorry, manage you know, the servers, potentially virtualize them. So this is one of the things that we were missing from our um, our reference you know, systems. Is everything was very um, high performance computing focused. It was everything was bare metal, stripped down. You know, with with performance being the key. Um, but that can sometimes be the, or you know, the perception is that could be the enemy of uh, flexibility. So um, we uh, we we started working with Stack HPC and looking to bring our IPUs uh, into that. So effectively, phase one of that was um, you know building an OpenStack cloud with our application servers uh, baked into it, so that we can then manage our uh, you know, manage the virtualization, starting to use. Um, our you know, OpenStack network, networking, um, which then means that you know, by using you know, DHCP uh, from, from OpenStack rather than having to run that on the systems, that started to move some of the, um, you know, some of the system services outside of the, um, outside of the vPod. Um, but then effectively what we were then doing is uh, plugging our IPU machines into the OpenStack infrastructure. They were still outside of OpenStack. Um, all we were doing effectively was creating some neutron ports that were associated with its network port, so they get handed out via DHCP. But OpenStack didn't have any um, uh, didn't have any understanding, any concept that these things were were there. Um, but then the final goal was actually to bring those IPU machines into OpenStack and be able to treat them as um, as first class citizens. Um, so so uh, yeah, so this is where we started to, or this is where we ended up with our um, uh, our Loki based IPU cloud. And uh, with our, our three key requirements was around isolation. So I've talked about some of the problems we had with you know, users crashing, crashing into each other. We wanted to be able to absolutely prevent that. Um, we didn't want to sacrifice performance. Um, but you, we, within GraphCore, we've got a lot of kind of high performance computing heritage. And you, know, you go to certain people still and talk, about, you know, talk to people about high performance computing and virtualization. Um, then you know, people will, will give you dirty looks and sort of say, well, you, you can't do both. Um, but we wanted to be able to kind of you know, try and demonstrate we'll ca you know, uh, that we can. 
Um, so we wanted to be able to you know, ensure that we, we achieved all the same level of performance, but then driving self-service. Um, so giving users the ability to uh, request the infrastructure that they, uh, that they needed. And so uh, I'm going to hand you over to John, who can uh, tell you a little bit more about how we developed some of this and what were um, you know, some of the processes we had to go through. Excellent. Thank you, Nathan. So I'm going to go through how we use Loki to create that kind of reconfigurable infrastructure and the isolated vPods, how we make that performant, as you said, crucial, and how we make that more accessible to users through the self-service. So let's start with the isolated bit, the reconfigurable bit. So it's a little bit like these sort of like reconfigurable conference rooms. And what I mean by that is you need to plan ahead to decide how you're going to slice up the system. So for example, if you're building a big supercomputer, sometimes you need all of the machine to be the supercomputer. Sometimes you have people doing medical research that need the performance of that supercomputer, but they need to be isolated from everyone else. So that's where this requirement for slicing and dicing um, high-performance infrastructure uh, it has, you know, one of the key requirements has come up. And another key requirement is development environments. How do I get a little slice of exactly the system that you're running in production? And again, this is kind of very close to the graphical case, right, where you can slice and dice it up. Sometimes the developers need a big system to test those kind of problems. Sometimes they only need a small test, you know, small test system. And we have this ability to slice and dice. So how do we do that? For the IPU machines, their the physical boxes attached with network cables to a physical switch. And if you squint at that setup, that's very like what Ironic does. So we, you used Ironic to actually change those switch ports. So to, create, to get hold of an IPU machine, you create an instance in Nova, and it's a, it's a flavor IPU machine. You can have multiple types of IPU machines, flavors. And what that does when you create it is it goes off to Neutron. Neutron reaches out to the switch. Actually, SSH is in with um, networking generic switch, or it's called as NGS. And it goes in and changes the access VLAN, for example, on those ports. So that, lets, that gives you that dynamic ability to say these VMs, these physical x86 machines, and these physical IP machines are all connected to the same neutron network, without really having to deal with a lot of the, uh, the actual nuts and bolts of putting that all together. It's all exposed through standard um, OpenStack APIs. So when you're talking to the IP machines, you need to use the Poplar SDK stack, generally speaking. That requires RDMA connectivity, um, remote something, memory access. Um, how we do that is we use SRV. So what is SRV? If you look at a lot of modern NICs, um, the NIC cards, they present a physical function and potentially several virtual functions into the machine. So what we do with SRV is we pick a virtual function and we pass that into the virtual machine. So inside the virtual machine, it sees um, a NIC. So the virtual machine has NIC drivers. And everything pretty much you can do on bare metal, you can now do inside the VM. In this specific case, these physical x86 machines are connected to a um, 100 gigabit ethernet bond. And we're, so rather than just doing the legacy SRV with that virtual function, we actually, we actually plug the virtual function into open vSwitch. Now, some of you are going, what's he done? He's thrown away all the performance he's put in Open vSwitch. But what happens is when the flows are established, Open vSwitch knows to talk to the hardware offload system to start th flowing packets through the hardware direct into the VM. And that's how you can actually get you know, the IB bandwidth tests running at line rate, just like it would be on a bare metal machine inside the VM. That sounds simple. There's always a few little things that you have to sort out with that. So for one example, um, these were AMD-based uh, Zen 2 systems, the x86 machines. What we found was in order to actually get that level of performance, you need to actually tweak the default BIOS settings to make sure that 
the, the PCI slot that your network card in is the preferred one. And you have to make sure that you get the right sort of level of NUMA. So this is me walking into the next slide, which is about performant VPODs. How do we get something a bit like the red arrows? And what I mean by that is, you know, we need to make the thing fly, we need it to be performant. We kind of need all the things to work together properly. So how do we do that? So as I was saying, we, we use this VF lag SRV. So using the OVS offloads, that gives us line rate inside the VM. And how do we, and I was talking about the IV bandwidth benchmarks and the latency benchmarks. There is a small-ish latency penalty for using VF lag versus legacy. That's a whole different talk. Um, but let's talk about how we optimize the Poplar SDK stack. So we took um, one of the ResNet ML Perf tests as the reference benchmark. And the challenge was, how close can we get to the bare metal machine version inside the virtual version, just as a baseline? Uh, it turns out, with lots of tinkering, we got the VM version going faster um, than the bare metal. Um, and to be clear, I was definitely cheating because we optimized the bare metal more than the previous bare metal setups were. We had to make sure that we had a consistency of firmware across everything, consistency of the BIOS settings. Um, so our good old friend Ansible came up, trumps, because so we use Ansible to automate all the enrolling of the ironic machines and making sure that we get good firmware across all of them and good, um, good BIOS settings and good iDRAC settings in this case, because it was Dell. So we achieved that. We were able to get that, that performance. Um, because this is a technical deep dive, why not let's go into some of the grubby details here? Because that's fun. Well, it's for me. Sorry if you're bored. So if we have a look at the AMD CPUs, they use a technique called chiplets. Um, if you go on some of the news articles, people love to show you the picture of what the silicon looks like. If you look really carefully, you'll see there's an I.O system in the middle and like chiplets around the outside. That I.O system is roughly speaking where the memory is attached to. Sort of. Let's pretend it's attached to the top and the bottom because there's several memory zones. And often, and in this case, it was two socket, wasn't it? So it's two sockets, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Um, so in this case, there were two of those. So traditionally, you go, ah, yes, two sockets, two NUMA zones, bish, bash, bosh, all done. Um, well, no, <laughs> basically. So in this particular case, what I didn't know at the time was that the bare metal was done using um, custom NPS settings. Um, and this, that's not net promoter score, that's numerous per socket. <laughs> so that will confuse people in all sorts of businesses. But anyway, um, NPS of four. Ah. Um, but anyway, so in these particular servers, uh, what we found was roughly, um, so this was Zen 2, not Zen 3, so it doesn't have shared cache in the chiplet, but let's ignore all that nonsense. Um, in this particular case, what we found is a good rule of thumb, actually, is to do numerous per socket equal to chiplets in your SKU. Um, now, I'm sure my wife would probably pull me up saying, what the hell are you talking about now? Um, so what I mean by that is in the particular different SKUs of the chip, the different versions, different models, they have different numbers of chiplets. Um, let's not go into binning chiplets and everything else, but it's cool. Um, there's a cool way they've got the flexibility, but um, this made a difference here. So let's zoom back up of, out of silicon design where I have no right to be. Um, so why was that interesting? Well, actually, it turns out that affects memory latency. So if you think of those chiplets, that's where the cache lives. So if your VM thinks it's got some CPUs over here in chiplet one and CPUs in chiplet two, and it thinks they're all in the same place, the Linux kernel, doesn't really optimize for the fact that they've got completely different cache zones. And that really impacts your memory latency. And there was a particular step in the ML perf test that was really latency, um, memory latency affected. So um, what, we, what we did is we basically, once you had that numerous per sockets, we then actually passed that configuration through in, in Nova flavors to slice and dice that. Um, so we were able to say, you know, Mr. VM, you have eight NUMA nodes or four NUMA nodes, and you have so many um, uh, cores per NUMA node. We also made sure that the thread pairs matched up as well, so that it knew if it was a real core or a pretend core, I mean thread. 
Um, I spent too long with these HPC people. Um, anyway, um, so I've had a big deep dive into CPUs because that would be fun. Um, so I've probably run out of time for all the other slides. Um, so azimuth is how we take all of this um, grubby details and optimizations and we make that repeatable. So what's the stack that we can go, you know, um, cookie cutter that out and actually get all of those performance optimizations? Um, I've just been doing a talk on azimuth and going into a lot of the details here. So let's uh, focus on the graphical specifics. Thank you, John. Um, so crucially, uh, you know, our developers uh, at Graphical are, you know, they're focused on AI and machine learning models. They're not terribly interested as, as much as we might be interested in, in all the stuff that, that John has been enthusing about. Um, <laughs> they don't really care. They just want the thing to work, and they want the thing to work repeatedly. They don't want to have to know what special um, you know, extra things to, to, access, uh, you know, to, to enable to, you know, to ensure that performance. Um, so being able to provide our self-service vpods um, through, uh, through azimuth basically means we can just set all the sensible defaults, enable all the required, um, you know, all the required gubbins just to make, that, uh, make those things work, and expose only the relevant, um, the, the relevant config um, that the users care about, things like what operating system am I running, how many IPU machines do I have access to. And um, by building on top of the, uh, you know, the, the, the workstation appliance, which you get out of the box with, uh, with Azimuth, because that's leveraging Terraform and or, you know, it's Ansible is then running, you're templating out some Terraform and then running the Terraform. Well, there's nothing stopping us from adding our own things into that. And we could go as custom as we wanted and as specific as we wanted uh, you know, into, into our infrastructure. And so what that meant was we could try and really bake a, you know, a first class uh, developer experience in so that users get access to all the, all the things that they, they expect to have um, when, uh, when logging into machines. So it's you know, single sign-on access to things. They've got a consistent home directory available. Um, uh, and, you know, they've got the applications that they, or, you know, the applications or the, um, you know, the, the operating system that they've requested. Everything is set up um, effectively ready to go. Um, so rather than just talking about it, um, this is the bit that we unfortunately didn't quite have time to do while we were um, running. Um, that is interesting. Why is my? You guys only have the presentation. Sorry. So <laughs> you're not mirroring. I was mirroring. Oh dear. Right, hang on. Let's try this one instead. Sorry, guys. There we go. Hey. Um, so, uh, so I can actually run through and build one of these. So um, you can see we've got uh, the selection of platforms that we have available. So um, Kubernetes is one of the things that you get out of the box with Azimuth. So if you want to, uh, you know, particularly if you've got an OpenStack cloud and you want a straightforward way to give your users access to, to Kubernetes, this is a fantastic way to do it. Um, uh, but then we've created our uh, compute appliance and our popular appliance. So um, these two are, uh, you know, have been set up very specifically for, for our graph core environment. Uh, so the compute appliance uh, is effectively the popular appliance, but without access to any of IPUs. Uh, and so it just means that users can get access to um, the same sort of development and working environment that they'd have access to, but without actually needing to tie up any IPU machines while they're, while they're using it. Um, so we can go, go through and um, create ourselves a, a system. I'm going to pick Ubuntu 2004. Um, uh, within our cloud, we've got two different versions of our IPU machines. So Bo is our current uh, latest gen system, um, but we've uh, you know, also have what we refer to as our classic systems, which is like the, uh, you know, the, the, the previous version. Um, but users can select one or the other, or they can just leave it to any, and, um, and then th that'll be selected. And then we can select the number of IPUs um, all the way from zero to 64. So the advantage of picking zero here is because actually this is one of the mutable fields that we have access to inside of our azimuth uh, system. So we can actually create a system with zero IPUs on the basis that you know, the developer wants to get started. They don't need access to it, but then they can, add, you know, they can then come back to it and say, actually, now I want to have 16 IPUs. And the infrastructure will get reconfigured while their appliance is, is still live, um, uh, still alive and running. So, um, so uh, 
Partitions in this context is, is actually how a virtual IPU uh, system works. So a partition is effectively a set of config that says these IPUs are available over on these machines over here. And so this is, um, this is provided uh, so we can choose either to create one for our users or you know, um, just, to, uh, just leave it. Um, we've got our set of uh, different set of flavors that we've got. And so this is a curated list so that we've, we've ensured that only the flavors that have all the relevant traits enabled um, uh, for it are, are made available there. And um, particularly in this case, is we've given a lifetime to the systems. Uh, one of the challenges, or one of the things we wanted to try and avoid was uh, you know, going back to the old days where systems just sat idle because people had picked them and said, I want this thing for the next month, please. And, um, and then they use it once in a blue moon. So um, for our, for our uh, popular appliances, we've got a maximum of 48 hours, uh, which means that they, they will always get churn and bring things back to the system. And then, uh, and then we can choose to, uh, to associate a floating, um, a floating IP with it. So um, building one of these appliances uh, it takes a couple of minutes because it's got to orchestrate all the, um, all the infrastructure on the back end. So while we're waiting for this to happen, um, I figure we've got an opportunity for if anybody has any questions of us, wants to know anything more about um, what we've been doing. Oh, that'd be brilliant, actually. Um, thank you. Just for the recording. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. So it's uh, basically a question regarding the VMs. You talked about the Numa nodes and yep. the, uh, the, the I.O. die. Um, one question is, you said you have a two-socket system. Um, now, from my knowledge, your NIC normally belongs to one of the PCIe buses belonging to the I.O. die. How do it you does. do that with SRIOV? Do you run two NICs and then sp schedule your VMs logically? Or how do you do that? That is a very good question. So. If I were a telco for going for maximum latency, I would do what you just said. Um, however, in this case, uh, I was a bit more worried about bandwidth. Um, and one of the limitations, actually, of using the VF lag SRV is it's the bond has to be on a single NIC. So it's a trade-off. If you want maximum latency, you can do the whole card per socket trick, and you can make sure that you schedule the right uh, card function. to the right, yeah, the right yeah. virtual function to the right locality of your NUMA and everything else. Also, in this case, we were having quite large VMs that sit, sit across both of the NUMA nodes when we were testing this. So on the very large case, we kind of didn't see so much of an impact because the, um, pretty sure the NIC came in on the right NUMA zone. That might have been luck rather than actual judgment. But the, yeah, so if you're using SRV, uh, with the VF lag with the OBS offload thing, um, it has to be on a single card. Okay, okay. So basically, the Infinity Fabric was fast enough for you in case of latency, and the bandwidth was enough. It was. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Are you sure that VF lag has to be on the same NIC? Uh, the question was, are you sure um, VF lag has to be on the same NIC? Um, What's the point of uh, assigning two VFs in a single bond from the same NIC? We don't assign two. So it's one VF oh. that runs at the rate of the bond. Um, so the question was, oh, am I certain that the VF lag only works in one NIC? 80%? Uh, um, it might depend on the NIC. <laughs> it certainly probably depends on the vendor. Um, th there's a lots of different OVS offload methods. This particular case, we're using uh, ConnectX 5 Mellanox NICs, right? Um, so in that case, yeah, it's one NIC. Um, the bond is in the one NIC, and you pass that through. The six would be a bit better in terms of um, security groups and things. But. So why is it a bond? Um, uh, magic? Um, so if we go back to testing this feature on uh, older generations, the, the VF is actually limited, as far as we can see, by the PCI generation. Um, so the, the bandwidth, in, so basically the bond is in the NIC. So the NIC knows how to do the bonding, and those packets flow down the PCI bus. So actually, you, you're limited by the PCI bus. So if you use these ConnectX 5s in a Gen 3 server, you can only actually get, uh, oh, I can't remember what it was, like 110 gigabits a second rather than um, 180 or so 200, because you're limited by the PCI Gen 3. Um, but these are Zen 2 AMDs, um, so you've got Gen 4, so we don't have that limitation. If that makes sense. Um, as to why, 
no idea, but Nathan Singh just worked, so woo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I guess to, you know, to add to, to one of the things that John mentioned, one of the advantages we had with using the bond is although you know, our focus has been RDMA access from our popular host yeah. to the IPU machine, that wasn't our only requirement for kind of high performance networking. So alongside um, access from our, uh, you know, the application access, um, uh, particularly you know, in, our, in our graph cloud system, um, we've got uh, one of the pure flash blades systems, which provides kind of very high performance uh, NFS. And so when we built one of our vPods, um, what we would do is we'd, we'd actually give one, um, you know, one VF would be used for the uh, your RDMA access, but then we'd also plug another VF in, which would be on a different VLAN dedicated for, uh, dedicated for storage access. One could. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I mean, for our, our kind of ideal, our performance, you know, our kind of maximum performance VM was effectively the same size as the, the bare metal system with just a little bit carved out of each NUMA zone to, to run the rest of the hypervisor. And so that was the one where we could, we could guarantee kind of the best performance. We, at that stage, we're not sharing with anybody else. We don't have to, um, you know, so that was, so um, one I of the things we had. just a quick thing on deep dives. Um, don't forget N Connect if you use it, if you're in that particular scenario. <laughs> the NFS N Connect makes a huge difference um, to make use of that bond. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, where was I? Um, oh, so one of the things that, you because know, we've, we've now been operating your know, OpenStack, uh, your IP using OpenStack for, for about two years at this point, and we've had a lot of opportunities to kind of learn the bits that work, have worked really well and where we've had opportunities to improve. So um, we have actually, we've you know, developed different performance classes across our clouds so that we can either provide, you know, kind of maximum performance you know, guaranteed, you know, guaranteed performance for things like benchmarking, and so we've, we have a, a Slurm HPC cluster running inside OpenStack, and that's got access to the performance-optimized um, you know, VMs. But where we have, um, particularly for your know, developers, um, sometimes, sometimes they absolutely need the performance-optimized. Other times it's more, it's just functional capacity. So um, we uh, give access to different flavors that have got um, you know, perhaps some oversubscription, oversubscription of, of CPU, oversubscription of, of network access. And so that basically allows us to have our, our cake and eat it in terms of we can provide full fat performance, but then we can also, in other cases, um, you know, cram as much onto a set of hypervisors as possible to help improve our utilization. Uh, that is a very uh, loaded question within uh, your, when, we, when we discuss with our, our, our users at the moment. Um, so it's, you know, the azimuth experience is um, kind of extremely straightforward um, in terms of picking what they, uh, you know, uh, what, they, what they want. They have a persistent home directory. Um, they have persistent uh, networks. So uh, you, every time that you get a new system, You'll get a um, you'll, you'll have access to your, all of your data will still be there. The only difference is it is a new VM each time. So anything that you've installed in the VM is a little bit different, uh, or you know might require a little bit of setup. Um, we've been looking at different things about how can we you know, help bootstrap that. So having your know, first uh, you know, upon first deployment run this Ansible playbook to install all the things. We have been trying to avoid making it too easy. Um, uh, the reason is because is, is, we've sort of said, it's like, can we not just have an API call that will just do all of this for us, please, and set it up? Um, but the problem is, as soon as we do that, you know, we have a lot of very capable developers um, who will have no problem with setting up a cron job, which at 7 o'clock every morning will fire up and create a you know, fresh system, whether or not they actually need it. So. Before you time check. Oh, yes. Um, oh, crumbs, we have, uh, we have un run over time, unfortunately. So. Um, uh, but crucially, uh, our system has been set up, and you know, just in terms of convenience features that our users have got access to, if they've created, if they've added a floating IP, they've got here is how you SSH into it. We don't have DNS integration yet, but that's something that we're looking to do. Um, and we've also we do things like setting convenience environment variables into those uh, systems. So uh, some of these things like how to access the uh, virtual IPU manager, they've got access to uh, straight away. They don't have to set any things. Things so. Um, 
So, well, I, I, yeah, unfortunately we've run out of time uh, to be able to tell you more. We, if, if we had the opportunity, we'd probably keep on going for a while. But uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.